morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to have you all here today. Good to see Phyllis with us this morning. Where are you up from? Pennsylvania or Tennessee? Tennessee. So we got Florida, we got Tennessee. Pennsylvania. Carbondale. All right, yeah, and we have special music today, okay? Which is great. Now last week I referred to Paul as Tall Paul, this one here. His name is Paul Wogan, okay? And he's gonna sing for us in a few minutes. So that's wonderful. Let's take a look at our announcements here this morning. I knew that threat would work, you see? <laughs> our sincerest condolences to the Conrad Buckingham family on the passing of Nancy Conrad last week. Nancy is uh, Donna Buckingham's sister. And so, uh, <coughs> Keep the family in prayer if you would. Sunday school after morning worship. Ladies meeting August 16th. August? What, August, that's a long ways away, isn't it? Yeah. Today's the last Sunday of July. How do you like that? The number is eight. Month eight. JFC Industries. That is... Uh, Joshua Shusowski, and uh, he did a bunch of work around the church for us, uh, including, you might have noticed that broken piece of sidewalk that's been broken, you know, since the turn of the century. <laughs> that's been fixed. Uh, corner was broken on the corner of the wall. Concrete repair, roofing on the churches on the side of the church here, the north side of the church. <laughs> Gutters and painted front doors and the back doors and porch pillars. And so we just want to thank Justin and, uh, and recommend him. Uh, if you need odd jobs done around your house, boy, I'll tell you what. He come and give you an estimate. He will, uh, if you get an et if, if you agree with him, then um, they'll write you a contract. And uh, you come and do a nice job for you. I recommend him. Anyways, that's that. Eleanor Tyson, uh, again, our friend from Scranton, she is at Allied Skilled Nursing, and we need to pray for her. Um, there's a good chance she's going to perhaps have to go to live with one of her daughters, but she certainly needs our prayers. All right, let's see what we have here. Let's turn in our hymnals to 128. Thanks We'll sing the whole hymn, by the way. <laughs> oh, yay, yay. Yes, all three verses. Standing as we sing.
bulletin and turn to the inside right hand side page. Where Phyllis and Lisa are going to read the first lines, women are going to read with them, and then we men will read the italicized lines. Ladies, if you would. Do not be selfishness or conceit. But in humility, count others better than yourselves. That each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born more like a man. became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above other than the name. That the name of Jesus is a religion to bow. And the heaven and on earth and under the earth. Thank you, may be seated. Now let's bow our heads, folks, we'll have a word of prayer. manifest yourself to us. Open the eyes of our hearts. Open our minds. Help us to understand this great relationship we have with you. Lord, there are people in this world that are very, very important. There are presidents, there are prime ministers, there's high-ranking officials, and only very chosen people get to speak to them, have an audience with someone like the Pope. But the creator of heaven and earth has told us that we should come openly to the throne of grace, that we should walk right into you, at your eternal throne, and come and speak to you about the concerns and cares of our lives, and to consider ourselves your children not just your servants, not just occupants of a kingdom, but the friends of God, the children of God, and to come and tell you the things that concern us, and to know that you hear them, and you respond to every last one of them, and they concern you. It's not someone who's sitting in heaven doesn't care, got bigger things to worry about. But you told us that you know how many hairs are on our head and that means you know us intimately and you're very concerned with us. So Father, speak to us about this great relationship we have with you. Lord, we got friends and family on the prayer list and uh, we got so many things to praise you for that, you know, we, we uh, have a way of just asking you for things when we're in need, but Lord, we would never stop praising and worshiping you. The gift of life itself is absolutely miraculous, hardly imaginable, and yet here we are. And so we thank you for the gift of life and for all the experiences we've had and for the things in our lives that have been great and the things in our lives that have been taxing and challenging and frustrating and defeating. <coughs> And yet we're here, still standing, better because of those things, thanks to you. Lord, we pray for our family and friends here. We pray for the Buckingham and Conrad family. We ask you to bring comfort and peace to them and soothe their hearts to know that they turn their beloved over to a gracious and merciful God, a God who loves us and would stop at nothing, including the death of his son, that we might be a part of your kingdom, a part of your family have eternal life with you. So our Heavenly Father, we have so much hope. We also have, uh, again, folk who've lost loved ones in recent days and in recent weeks and 
sometimes untimely and sometimes we see it coming, but nevertheless, our Heavenly Father, we bring, ask you for comfort and peace to the family and friends of those who need it and who miss their loved ones. We pray today, Lord, for those who need healing. We're so grateful for what we have seen around us. For over the years, we've seen incredible things take place. People who were in conditions that were, by the world standards were just hopeless. And yet we've seen people flourish. Pray especially today, Lord, for uh, Joe and Clary Fuga. We ask you to continue to be with them as they really climb this mountain back to normalcy. They're not trying to get somewhere special. They're just going to get to where they can get through days. So please help them, Lord. And we also pray for our friends out in Wisconsin. Thank you so much for Bruce Bennett and the influence he's had, certainly on my life and on the lives of so many of our ministers. I mean, when we came in, Bruce was like an older brother and surely set a great example. Between him and his dad, we thank you for that. But we ask your blessing on that church out in Wisconsin. We also pray for Betty Warmoth, and we ask you to watch over her. Again, Lord, talk about somebody who's been a blessing. Just her faith in you, her love, literally a childlike faith for you. And we ask your blessing upon her now in uh, these days and weeks that uh, in some ways can be challenging. We ask you to put your hand upon her and take care of her. We're also thinking of our friends down in Columbia and the missionary work that goes down there. We ask you to continue to strengthen and encourage and raise up salvation for whosoever will. Lord, we pray for our country. Pray for the spirit of our country, Lord. Uh, we've seen things this week, uh, and, and specifically in terms of uh, the Olympics and what is thought to be entertaining. And, Lord, we just really need help. We really need light. We need some guidance in this country. We pray that you would send light. And not just send the light, but we pray that you might have many down here in this world receive it. Lord, speak to us about all these things. We're going to pray without ceasing, Lord. But our public prayers will end here. We're going to ask you to hear and answer the things that are in our hearts. As we say together, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the privilege of hearing the special music of Paul Wogan. <coughs> it's one of my favorite uh, Christian songs uh, from just right after, probably this album I got was maybe my first Christian album by Fernando Ortega. As long as sing to Jesus. Come and see. Look on this mystery. The Lord of the universe. Nailed to a tree. Christ our God. Spilling his holy blood. Bowing in anguish, his sacred head, sing to Jesus, Lord of our shame, Lord of our sinful hearts. He is our great Redeemer, sing to Jesus, honor his name. Sing of his faithfulness, for in his life, out on to death. Come, you weary, and he will give you rest. Come, you who mourn, 
lay on his breast Christ who died risen in paradise giver of mercy giver of life sing to Jesus his is the throne now and forever he is the king of heaven sing to Jesus we are his own now and forever sing for the love our God has shown sing to Jesus Lord of our shame Lord of our sinful hearts he is our great Redeemer sing to Jesus Honor his name, sing to Jesus, his is the throne, now and forever, he is the king of heaven, sing to Jesus, we are his own. Now and forever, sing for the love our God has shown. Paul, oh, that was beautiful. That had a... You got um, Irish in you, Scottish, what is it? No. Oh. That's it. Henry. Henry Polish. <laughs> Got a Celtic ring to it. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Before we start, how about you tell your neighbors how glad you are they're here today? After our, uh, after we received the prayer request, I took one of the earphones out, or here, they're here again. I call them ear muffs. <laughs> one time I said to Beth, I says, I, I, I went, when, I, when I got them, I said, I went and got, I'm going to get these ear muffs. And she says, uh, do you have to go to Best Buy for them? Don't they have them like, you know, right aid? And she's thinking, I'm thinking of little earplugs, you know. No, I'm sorry about these. Anyways, when I took the first ones out, I thought, okay, I won't have to hear it. You hear all these loud noises, like sharp noises really come through. And as soon as I said, tell your neighbor how glad y'all are here to see each other, it's like an eruption. <laughs> now, I don't have to hear anything more for the rest of the day. I'm going to take the last one out. I can still hear without them, right, Barbara? Right. See, she said right. <laughs> That's an ongoing. I didn't hear what she said, but. Maybe I better put it back in. <laughs> Let's, have, let's just uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll start, okay? Lord, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. Again, Lord, if we had never been, we would have missed so much. I mean, to never have seen the light of day, to never have looked into mom and dad's face as a little kid, never know what a Christmas tree was, a car, a cloud, fish. I mean, 
And then we meet people in our lives that we just love and we want to be with. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for all these things. Would you please come and manifest yourself to us? Would you open the eyes of our hearts? Lord, it's real easy for the limited time we have down in this world to have a physical experience. See things, touch things, smell them, taste them, all the rest. But to really have life is the gift of God that was purchased with nothing less than the very blood of Christ. A treasure indeed. Would you please come and speak to us this morning, Lord? We might understand what life is. It's you. And it's our connection with you. Our loving relationship with the creator of all things. Please come and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and then he hid it. And then in his joy he goes and he sells everything he has and he goes and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls and on finding one pearl of great value, the pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea. Caught fish of every kind and when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but they threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? Jesus said to his disciples. And they said, oh yes. He said, well, I'll tell you what then. Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded. They said, where did this man get this wisdom? And these deeds of power. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers and James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said, you know what? Prophets are not without honor, save in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Jesus wraps up this segment of parabolic teaching. Remember these parables, their comparisons, they compare something. It's a heavenly, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus is speaking in parables, and he said to the disciples earlier, he said, why do you always speak in parables? And he said, because to you has been given the gift of understanding the mysteries of eternity things that have been hidden forever. And you have the privilege of understanding them. Do you, do you understand what that's like? To understand the things of the kingdom of God? We live in a whole world. When I was a kid, we had this, in fact, it's fascinating. Um, I was looking at, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Pinterest. One day, and lo and behold, there's this dollhouse on Pinterest. And it's the exact same dollhouse we had when I was a kid, which had been my mother's and my aunt's when they were kids. They had this like, it was really a masonite kind of a roof with brick or shingles, red shingles on it. It had a little porch and the door would open up. And it had little stairs inside it. 
and you turned it around in a swivel, and it had different rooms. And like the bathroom, it really had like a little plastic bathtub in there. And there was little, a, a little couch in the living room. And there was little things in the kitchen, like you'd find in the kitchen, you know, like a sink and stuff. And that, that thing was fascinating. It was full of compartments. And that's the way religion was to me when I was a kid. It was a compartmental deal. There were a lot of facets to life. I mean, when I went to Little League for the first time, I think it was in uh, 1969, and uh, we watched a film of the 68 Detroit Tigers beat the 68 St. Louis Cardinals who had Bob Gibson, and it just turned me on to sports. And every time sports was on TV, me and Dad would be there watching, and what a time to grow up in New York State. The 69 Mets beat the Baltimore Orioles in five games. They weren't even supposed to be on the field with the Orioles. And they beat them in five games in the most, it was Mets magic. The most fantastic plays you've ever seen in your life in the field. Timely hitting. And then the New York Jets. They were supposed to lose to the Baltimore Colts. I think they were 34 point underdogs. But you remember Joe Namath with the white shoes? And from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And lo and behold, the New York Jets beat the mighty Baltimore Colts. And it was the greatest thing. And then the New York Knicks. The Knicks played in the NBA championship and Willis Reed had that bad ankle and there was, oh, is he gonna be able to play? Isn't he gonna play? And all of a sudden, Madison Square Garden erupts. Out comes Willis Reed. That was the sports part of my life. Dad put a basket in the driveway. We'd shoot baskets, he'd come home from work, we'd play catch with the football or the baseball or shoot baskets. That was that part of my life. And that was Grandma's house. We'd go to Grandma's house every single Sunday and sometimes during the week. And Grandma would have this big pot of sauce on the stove and there'd be meatballs and brejo all in there and there'd be chunks of pork and chunks of chicken and dinner would come out and there'd be greens, there'd be a green soup, which I didn't like at the time. <laughs> now I would love it. But then came out, you know, homemade raviolis or gnocchi or something like that. And after that out came the roast beef and or ham. And it was the greatest thing. That was grandma's house. She lived in a house in the city. We lived in the country where we lived you might wake up and a cow might be staring into your bedroom. Or there might be pigs running through the yard and dad chasing them, getting them out of the yard. Fields as far as you could see, mountains and hills as far as you But when we went to grandma's house, she lived in the city. And there were street lights. And you could hear traffic at night. And you could look out grandma's window and see an Atlantic gas station down there. Remember they had those tires would be on display and they'd be wrapped with foil all around them. And they put them out on display that they sold tires there. That was grandma's house. She had different grass in her, yard, little, her little yard in the city. Different grass than what we had out in the country. And then there was the school compartment. <laughs> I, I, wished I, had, <laughs> I wished I had long hair back then, you know? And uh, if it got even in, you know, a quarter, a half inch beyond the standard, mom would comb my hair, the part was here, it was the standard look. But it was the 60s, and I wanted to be like these swinging cats on TV. And so one day we're out on the bus stop waiting for the, not at the school, the elementary school, I probably was in kindergarten, maybe second, maybe first or second grade anyways, and I was gonna fling my hair out of my eyes, which it couldn't even get there, but I was gonna do it. <laughs> so I wound up with all my white and swung and my glasses went flying across the street. 
for whatever reason, the teacher kept sending me out into the hall. She'd take your desk out in the hall. I'd take my desk out in the hall. She says, you're going to be there for two days. And the principal comes down the hall and she says, what are you doing here? And I'm terrified. I used to call her, she was Mrs. Clayton. I always called her Clayball, you know? That was the funny, not to her face. Well, here comes Clayball. And she said, what are you doing out here? She was terrifying. Word had come through that she pulled Penny Blair's hair. I, I, I have to sit out here. You'll come to my office for three days. Well, I'm only supposed to be out here for two days. You're coming to my office for three days. And Mrs. Clayton was no fun. Later on, Mrs. Long. She liked, I mean, I got, I got sent to the principal's office for hitting a kid with snowballs. And she said, until all the snow was melted off the playground, you ain't going out for a playground anymore. <laughs> Syracuse, New York, that's a bad deal. <laughs> so I was in there for probably two months. And it was fun. I liked her a lot. That was school. And then there was church. St. Anne's Church, Manlius, New York. You know, it was a classic little old small town Catholic church, but it had an elaborate, you know, uh, tabernacle back here and statuesque things and statues literally and everything. Nuns were a part of it and the priest, you get to talk to the priest. Once in a while we'd get a priest, he'd like to go hunting and fishing. He was like a regular guy and it was pretty cool. And, uh, and, and, you know, the nuns, I still remember the lessons they taught us. Feed a man, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Give him a fishing pole and teach him to fish and you feed him for a life. And uh, the songs we used to sing, they don't come to my mind right now, but they might. And I might sing a solo here. <laughs> we get some more solos. And so anyways, but that was religion. Jesus was the feature of the religion, but it was a compartment. It was like one of those rooms in that house. The kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. And in his joy he goes and he sells all that he has and he goes and buys the field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in a search of fine pearls. And he finds one pearl of great value. And he went out and sold all he had. The kingdom of heaven is not a compartment. I would later learn in my life that Jesus wasn't the head of that compartment. He wasn't the primary feature. I mean, the, the little bathtub in the, bed, in the, in the uh, bathroom in the little dollhouse, that was the feature. And then the little stove in the kitchen was the feature. And in the religion part, Jesus was the feature, or God was the feature. Somehow they were the same. And then I find out they're not the feature. They're the whole deal. They're everything. What is your life worth? What is a man's life worth that it wouldn't trade for this? Treasure, you know the word treasure, it's the word thesaurus. A thesaurus is a treasure of words. And this treasure in the field's hidden and someone finds it, he sells everything he has that he might get it. How valuable is the kingdom of God to us? How valuable is it in the lives of your children? Ouch. I remember reading that it costs about a quarter of a million dollars to raise a kid. I don't think that includes college. I think that just gets them to the door of college. Well, how much money do we spend on our kids? Well, we we're just talking, Gene, right? Before service. I have like my 16th birthday. I got a uh, digital alarm clock. A night, a, a night side, bedside digital alarm clock for my birthday. That was the feature present. And it wasn't a disappointment. It was like, wow, it's digital. This is pretty cool. It's got like wheels on it and it's got the numbers on it. 
And I thought it was really, it was almost like it had a stereo. Well, how would that cut it nowadays? We get that, yeah, Joyce last. we get those, and they, they come free with the real stuff. And when microwave ovens came out, I remember David Mapstone had a microwave oven in Manlius, and it was like thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think he could get them down at Walmart for, or at Wegmans for 25 bucks for a cheapie. And our kids, I watched a kid the other day get out of the car. She, her mom drops her <coughs> off at her friend, two, two young girls. Mom drops her off at her friend's <coughs> house. She gets out of the car, glued to that phone. Walks around, glued to the phone, gets in the car, never takes her face off it. Sits down in the car with her friend who's probably in there glued to her phone. <laughs> And I bet it wasn't my track phone, which cost 20 bucks. I got a clamshell. <laughs> and I don't want any more. We spend $800 on a phone, camera, so that our kids can have a nice life. And if the kids want to go to camp, how much does it cost? Whatever. If the kid wants to go, you can't play high school sports anymore, can you, without going to a summer camp specialized in whatever sport you're going to play? You can't just show up from the sandlot. You, when I was a kid, we played baseball. It was a horse pasture that we cut the grass in it and we turned it into a baseball field. And now we got how many fields in our town? And guess how many kids are playing on them on a, any day afternoon and none is right. We'll spend mountains of money to make sure our kids have a great life. And the most important thing in the world, you can't buy with money. You can't buy them enough toys. You can't buy them enough Bibles. You can't buy, bring them to church. You can't bring them to church often enough. It has to come into their hearts. We live in a society that's gone horribly adrift. I don't know how many of you watch the Olympics. Uh, I'm not watching the Olympics just because I'm not really interested in it, but I don't know if you saw the uh, entertainment, I guess, that uh, let in. You know, the drag queens who reenact the Last Supper. Yeah, wait till you see who Jesus is. You think, did you, you didn't see, did you? Wait till you see Jesus. Your wildest dreams, you'll not dream that one up. We're entertaining the masses. We're entertaining the whole world, we think. And meanwhile, probably offending the largest portion of the population. But we'll take that chance when I say we, I mean the International Olympic Committee or any other organization appeal and let people have what they want, be what they want, rebel in the way they want, do anything you want. Because religion, that's the last on the list. Unless, of course, you want to be a witch. Or if you want to be a genuine warlock. Why then, we, that's chic, that's cool, that's in. And meanwhile, the kingdom of heaven you here sitting in the room know it's the pearl of great price. I don't know how many times I've heard over the years in this very room, in this very church, talking to people at their bedside when they're on their way to dying. And they'd say, I don't know what I'd ever do without the Lord. I don't know how people get through the day. And these are people who are laying there, their bodies just have been eaten away with cancer. And they're on the last leg. Or they're barely alive and some terrible thing has happened to them. And all they can say is, I, I remember thinking when I first came into ministry that was going to be a tough deal to be at the bedside of people. Because my idea was what was going to happen was you'd go to the bedside of the person who's like on the way out and they'd be very bitter. 
hey, we spent our whole life in church and it's going to amount to this. I'm going to die in this miserable death. What good did going to church do me? Cheese. And I find the exact opposite. No mountain high enough. No suffering intense enough. But that they would say, God has been so good. That's the pearl of great price. Our TV and our doctor's office go. Tell them what your problem is. And I bet any money they got a little pill that'll solve your problem. They'll sell them to you. Or else we, we can inject you with this, or we can do this, or we can do that. Whatever your problem is, we got a pill for it. Meanwhile, the pearl of great price is the answer to every problem. It's the pill that never wears out. It's the one that walks you to the very doorway of death and it gives you a heart and a soul where you don't look with regret, but you look back on your life with nothing but thanksgiving. What's the greatest thing? My, my father wasn't really on the outside a religious person by any means. He wasn't a pagan. We were in church every single Sunday, but he didn't wear his faith on his sleeve. If you asked him something, he'd say, you know, probably, he talked to you about it a little and say, you probably ought to talk to the priest about that. He'd send you to the authority. Dad's dying days. Dad, what's the greatest thing he ever did? Married your mother. Married your mother. I don't know how many times I've heard that. What's the greatest, what's the best choice you ever made in your life? And the mom was, I don't think moms say that very much. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think of it, it's almost always the dad that says that. <laughs> I have to think about that one. <laughs> What's eternal life worth? We're worried about healing down here in this world. On the other side of death is ultimate healing. Do you realize how used to we are, how, how, you, how, how familiar we are with death and sickness and suffering? It's just a part of life. We don't even think, it, it's, but it's abnormal. Death is not supposed to be a part of our experience, right? We're placed in the Garden of Eden in total innocence where there was no death, there was no sickness, there was no suffering. But there was one thing there, it was called free will, and God would come and test it. Satan, what does he do? Is Satan running wild? He's busting loose from God? He's shirk the chains, and now he's going to do whatever he pleases. No, when we see Satan in the Bible, he's coming to God, and God is limiting him. He's telling him, yeah, you can test Job, but only this far. Yeah, you can do this, but this far, and don't forget, there's some chains reserved for you on the last days. God ends up using evil to make good. Satan comes to us in the Garden of Eden. If the Bible says God prepared a garden for the man. Now God knows everything, right? He knows we're not going to be in that garden very long. But he's in there making sure it's nice. He's in there making sure it's right. Preparing a garden for his people. And they go in. And they shed that righteousness, that innocence, that purity they had. And next thing you know, they're outside east of Eden, in the land of wandering. Cain is killing his brother. And a few chapters later, we see God say, geez, I wish I never even made man. All the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. He only thinks of himself. He never thinks of others. He's nothing like us, the Lord says to his son. I wish you'd never made him. Why don't we just wash him off the face of the earth? Maybe that's the solution. And so the flood of Noah came. 
and it wasn't the solution. And then the scattering at the uh, Tower of Babel. And all that did was put off the problem. But then God came to a man named Abraham. His name was still Abram at the time. And you know what he said to him? Hey, Abram, you don't have any children. You don't have a place to call home. You're a wandering nomad. Okay, that's what the Bible calls him, a wandering nomad. Abram, how about if I give you children so great, so numerous, that if you could count the stars in the sky, you'd have that many. Or if you could count the sands on the seashore, that's how many children you'll have. You don't have anything now, and your wife's incapable of anything now. But see, this is the God who makes things come to be that aren't. This is the God who looks at this chaotic creation of His. Okay? In the beginning, the earth is a formless void. It's a formless void. Doesn't have any shape. Doesn't have any light. You can't see anything. You can't detect anything. You can't differentiate anything. It's just this deep. It's called an abyss. And God speaks to who? To all eternity. Let there be light. And there's light. God speaks to Abraham. Abraham, the things you don't have now, I'll easily give you. And Abraham, if you'll come and follow me, we'll bless the whole world. Abraham, if you come and follow me, just imagine it. People who were not even on the planet back then, like us, will have eternal life, an eternal blessing, and a relationship with who? The God who speaks, and that which isn't comes to be. It's the pearl of great price. We open every single Sunday service. What do we do? We pray, right? We take prayer requests. And then we talk to God. I mean, we don't have to send any documents or papers down to Washington and say, you know, we're applying for this. What's the regulations? And then 13 lawyerly exchanges afterwards, we find out what we may or may not have to do. And then it's going to cost $16,000. We're invited into the kingdom of God. We're invited into the very throne of God. We're invited not like a servant in the kingdom or like his lead soldier who has to come because he's been on an assignment. He says, you just come in openly. The word is boldly. Boldly or openly. Like a kid who comes in. And he doesn't know his father's John F. Kennedy, the president of the world, president of the United States. But the kid comes bursting in the room and runs up and grabs his leg and calls him daddy. And the God who created the heavens and the earth, you come and treat me that way. That's the relationship I want with you. I want you to come in and grab me around the leg and say, daddy, I'm afraid. Daddy, I need something. Daddy, I want something. Daddy, whatever. It's the pearl of great price. And it's so valuable that few people will ever find it. Right? Boy, we got a parable coming up very shortly where fish are getting separated and they're putting fish into the good baskets and then they're getting bad fish. And at the end of the age, the angels will come out and they'll separate the evil from the righteous throw them into a furnace of fire. I, uh, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't like to talk about hell. I don't like to think about hell. I don't like to preach about hell. But you know what? I, what I, that's why I like going through the Bible. Whenever the Bible talks about hell, we'll be able to talk about hell. And there's no softening this, is there, really? 
Oh, hell, well, it's the absence of the presence of God or it's separation from God. Okay, that sounds pretty philosophical. But Jesus himself talks about this in terms of a furnace of fire and weeping of gnashing of teeth. Separating evil from righteous. So you put in a situation where everybody around you is evil. Everybody around you is suffering. Everybody around you is misery. And the worm dieth not. It sounds like it's forever, doesn't it? It's a terrible thing. It's a horrible thing. And it's so unnecessary. But the pearl of great price is so available. And what did Moses say? What do you have to do? To get this pearl of great price. Climb up into the heavens with a ladder that we don't have. Build a tower of Babel. That God comes down from heaven to see what are they doing down there. And then he just scatters them like so many ants. Or do we tunnel down into the core of the earth? Get down in there where I guess there's lava and molten and oh, whatever, burning metals. You don't have to go there either. He says it's right there before you. It's right in your presence. Jesus said, if I came and if I healed by the power of God, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven is among you. The kingdom of heaven is in you. That's how present this is. That's, I think, why it's so easy to miss. Why it's so easy to compartmentalize the visible features of Christianity like I did when I was a kid. And they were just one more compartment in a whole series of things that were the features of life. And meanwhile, the source of it all sits and says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come and take my yoke upon you, learn of me. And you who come to me, I'll in no wise cast you out. I came to seek and to save you. The world's busy trying to figure out who, who's the biggest sinner? Who's the unrighteous person that's unworthy of public trust? And meanwhile, Christianity is all about forgiveness. It's all about mercy. It's all about grace. It's not about who the holiest is. There's none that's holy. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the world's characterization of Christianity becomes a compartment with a club in it that we can use to bludgeon that which we don't like. And meanwhile, the kingdom of God, it's the key that opens every door and makes life livable. And talk about salvation, save from what? Safe from that fire that's reserved for those who are wicked and evil. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because our Heavenly Father, this isn't something that's an option. This isn't something that's just a philosophical feature that yeah, we might be interested in or we might not. And the girl down at work might say, well, I don't believe in any of that stuff. But meanwhile, Jesus himself, the one who was crucified, buried and resurrected, he's alive and well. The one who communes the things of God with us by the Spirit. The one who communes with our heart. The one who enlightens our mind, enlightens our soul, enlightens our spirit. He he's the light that enlightens every man, and he came into this earth. Father, speak to us about this. It's the pearl of great price. To get it is to get everything. And to pass it up is to lose everything. We stop at no expense to try and find the pleasures of this world when the pleasures of eternity are absolutely free. The gift of God, our Heavenly Father, would you speak to our children? Would you speak to our neighbors? Would you speak to our friends and family? Would you speak to us? That we might not miss this great gift and spend eternity 
in such an unworthy, un, 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 unnecessary place. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn in our hymnals and sing number 549. Five four nine.